Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a special edition of the show. Now I've got Eddie Osterland here, the very first American Master Sommelier uh, with me via Skype. And uh, this is awesome. Um, he sent me a book called Power Entertaining. We're going to be talking about that. I did read the book. Um, like, you, like you said, sometimes people say I'll read the book eventually. I read the book. It's awesome. Uh, so Eddie, let's, let's kind of get into it. Let's who you are and how you got started and, and kind of tell, tell everybody a little bit about what you, who you are. Well, okay. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm the oldest sommelier. I don't know if I'm the oldest, but I'm the first. But, uh, <laughs> I go back into like, being a sommelier in the in late 60s. Right. And let me tell you this. This is like, uh, I mean, I never intended to get in the wine business. No way. I was studying behavioral psychology at the University of Hawaii in graduate school. I took a job at night working as a waiter in an Ilikai hotel just to kind of get through, you know, get some money going. And some night about 10 minutes to 6, the maitre d' comes up to me and he's, he's wielding this cup and a silver chain that the, the, the French sommelier in a restaurant wore. And he hangs around my neck and he goes, hey, Eddie, Pierre just called in sick. Uh, you do you got to do this tonight. I looked at the guy. I'm 23 years old. I only drink beer. I never even seen the wine list. I said, no, effing way. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I won't. The guy says, you want to keep your job? Here's the rules. Red wine. You serve that with meat. White wine. It goes with fish. Anybody on the fence? Pitch them a rosé. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Back back in the 70s, there was only two rosés on a wine list, Lancers or Matus. <laughs> <laughs> so believe it or not, you know, I, I ran around the room that night, and uh, I didn't know anything about wine, so I memorized one wine on the list, Chateau Belgrave. You know, I go to every table and go, Chateau Belgrave, you know, nice and fruity with a crisp, clean finish, $35, and they would buy anything I said. And at the end of the night, I had a pile of money in my pocket. I couldn't believe I was making a whole bunch of money serving wine, and I didn't know a freaking thing about it. So I said, oh, what if I did know something about it? And I gave yes. that thought. And, um, you know, there's a lot more to the story, but basically I, I moved to France to study uh, for, uh, for a degree in professional wine tasting at the University of Bordeaux. And I did that for about three years. And uh, while I was over there, I went over and took the Master Soma exam because no American – had ever done that, and I, I, I'd heard about it while I was in Europe, but I thought, I can, let me see how good I am, and I never took it and passed it on the first try, and I haven't looked back since. But I mean, I'm back, and when I went back to Honolulu after that, I mean, the sommeliers back then, we were all we were all the same kind of people. We would go to a table with their tasting cup and sample people's wines because the people back then had no confidence in their own ability to just perceived qualities or anything, so they want some guy to verify whether the selection they made is un unbelievable. And people knew nothing about it, so, you know, that's why I wanted to go study it, because no one knew anything about it, but if I know something, it means I'm better off. So that's how I got started. So you actually, I mean, back in the day, you actually took that the little cup and you actually tasted it for them. At every table. At every table. We got, <sighs> got pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was just ornament, you know. I mean, I, I thought they did it like hundreds of years ago, but I didn't think they. I'm sure they don't do it really that much now, but still. No, I just, they don't now, but 40 years ago, I mean, it was accepted protocol that the sommelier would come to your table and you know taste your wine. Sometimes I played games on people, you know, because I thought I thought it was facetious and kind of crazy, but the people expected it, you know. So I went, okay, I'll take a sip of your hundred dollar bottle of wine. But uh, one day I had a I had a waiter come out to a table, and. Um, he was serving some guys with steak, Diane, and when he uh, got the thing all flambéed and the, the, the fire went out, he, he cut himself a piece of the guy's steak and tasted it. <laughs> the guy said, what are you doing? And he was looking at me with my taste still dripping, and he says, well, I uh, saw so that sommelier was tasting your uh, steak, uh, your wine, so I thought that would uh, make sure your steak is okay. <laughs> he played, he played all nice. kinds of games. I mean, it was people back then, they really didn't know much about taste. I mean, for example, I was sitting in a restaurant one night, I was just kind of goofing with a bartender. It was about 10 minutes to 6, and people started, you know, we're in Honolulu, so it's a hot, hot climate. People were drinking Tanqueray and tonics all the time, and they'd order them as a tea and tea, you know, give me right. a tea. 
So I said to the bartender one, I said, how about this? How about every time somebody orders a tea and tea, you pour the cheapest well gin you got in that glass, and let's watch everybody get delivered that. 25 of them went out over three hours. Not one person said, hey, this ain't Tanqueray. That, that fascinated me. I went, oh, these people are buying a brand. They call it brand awareness. It's more rather brand unawareness. Right, right. I got interested in saying, I got to study this thing called taste. Yeah, you know, and I, I kind of agree with that. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm in the industry and, and you have people that will order a brand name of, of, a, of a liquor and they're mixing it with something and I'm just kind of like, well, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. But the only thing that might happen is if they drink a lot of it, maybe they won't have as bad of a hangover. They'll have less impurities. But other than that, it, it's not going to be able to tell the difference if they're mixing it with something, you know. Uh, it's, it's really quite something uh, to watch people. I mean, <laughs> one night I'm in a restaurant. Some waiter comes up to the bartender and he's got a he's got a tip he's got a cocktail tray with a couple of martinis on it, and he puts them down in front of the bartender and goes, "Table twenty six just sent these extra dry martinis back. They're not dry enough." The bartender, this Japanese fellow, about seventy five years old, reaches back, grabs two wine glasses, takes this to hit the guy's martinis, dumps them into wine glasses, puts them on a tray, and says, "Go give them those. They'll love them." The waiter goes back, drops the same drinks in front of the people in wine glasses, and they give them a buck to the, give to the bartender because they said that's the way we like our martinis, extra dry. So I'm asking the guy, I said, what are you, what's going on there? He goes, son, in this business, when someone orders an extra dry martini, we just pour straight gin. It doesn't get any drier than that. So if they send it back and it's not dry enough, you got to change it in a new package in a wine glass. So that was the fascination of, uh, of the stuff. I mean, I'll tell you another one. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, 10 minutes later, the bartender's sitting there. Some waiter comes up and says, uh, give me a Doors and Soda on a rocks with a twist. The guy reaches down, grabs a bottle of Cuddy Sark, and he makes the drinks. And I, I looked at him, I said... <laughs> I ordered doors, and the guy said, "Yeah, we're out of doors. It's downstairs." I, so I just poured the cutty, and I said, yeah, "That's not what they ordered." He goes, "Hey, doors, cutty. These people are tourists. They're consumers. That's why I call them consumers. They don't taste." He goes, "She just poured it in here, mixed it with soda. It's been, it's been melting for five minutes before it gets to their table. No one's going to return that." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, that unfortunately, folks, that, that's the facts. I mean, you know. There's there's things that you might be able to taste like you know if there's a, a flavor profile like I did I have a story where uh, I, I was a big Captain Morgan fan and uh, uh, I started drinking it and I went to, I went someplace and I got my drink back and I said this isn't right and uh, the waitress said well no he gave you a Captain Morgan and Coke I said no he didn't he gave me Myers mm -hmm. you know but they have two completely different fla flavor profiles. and she went back to the bartender and the bartender was was going to argue with her he's like no I handed Oh, and the bottles got switched. Yeah. He, somebody had worked the bar the previous day, and the, the Myers was in a different spot than the Captain Morgan, and the bartender was actually surprised I could tell the difference. But, you know, that's something where Myers has a completely different flavor profile than Captain Morgan. You and know? you know it, and you're, you know, you, you, you drink it all the time. Man, I know, I know Doors from Cutty Stark any day, but uh, the average guy doesn't, really, right. in my opinion. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get a little flack from that, but I don't think... <laughs> know too much about it. <laughs> Same thing with beer, you know, Bud Light and Miller Light, another completely different styles of beer. And if you do know that, that's that's more than most people know. Mm -hmm. But uh, after a couple beers, if, if you're out of Bud Light draft and you give a Miller Light draft, they're not going to know the difference. So, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that this stuff happens in the real world, but it does. <laughs> you know, it does. And, you know, that along those lines, I don't want to one of the things you probably saw in my book is uh, I, I work as a coach to executives. I mean, Master Sommeliers, there's 128 of us, we come in all different flavors, and you've met many of them. Yeah. And I've carved out a niche in the last 15 years where I'm sort of a, 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 an executive business coach. I mean, I have clients sometimes, the, one of them, I've done 240 presentations in seven years just for their, for their clients. And I tell them real, right off the bat, I said, you know, I went and studied professional wine tasting in Bordeaux and spent three years and got a Master Sommelier and all this. The thing I learned in Bordeaux was when you do, we did our tastings at 11.30 in the morning and they were done at noon. 30 minutes long, we did them real early in the morning. Why? Because food or wine tastes best when you're hungry and at 11 o'clock in the morning, that's when you're hungriest and you're sharpest. And um, why so quickly? Because you don't stay hungry very long and your palate is very fragile. And so people say, well, so what? And I go, well, how about this? The average American being really generous, especially the American business guy who's bringing people over to his home or going out to a restaurant. They go out and they load up their bar with all kinds of dips and chips and nuts and guacamole and pretzels and whatever, crudite and, you know, the whole deal. People, I've noticed, because I studied behavioral psychology, they don't like being hungry. Everybody, myself included, right. don't like being hungry. So they come into your house 
and just like you, on your red table in front of you, you know, you got all that stuff in front of people. They're going to start nibbling and noshing and nibbling and noshing. And when they come up for air about 20 minutes later, they go, oh, Mark, man, that was great. I was so famished. I needed to take my edge off. And I tell them, if you let them take their edge off, how are you going to impress them? Because their appetite starts at a 10 out of 10. They'll drop it to a 3 out of 10 in three minutes. In restaurants, I don't let the rolls come to the table. No bread, no dips, no olive oil, because people will pummel three rolls before they see the freaking menu. You know, how are right. you going to wow if they haven't got appetite? So start with the best thing first, you own them. <laughs> yeah, like, well, the, the you talk about in the book, start the best thing first. So wine, what, what do you normally start with uh, on wine? Well, you know, I mean, whatever you think is the most egregious food and wine combination, I'm not going to tell somebody what to serve. You know what you like. You know what two things go together really well, right. whether it's a uh, Riesling and smoked salmon or caviar and champagne or foie gras or whatever. But none of, none of these crudite and, you know, Jesus, no, no freaking vegetables with ranch dip and, you know, crunchy cheese, fish and all nuts. You know, I mean, I love a macadamia nut. I'll eat a, I'll eat a whole can of them. You know, if you put it in front of me, that's the only thing there. But right. it's, it's time to hit the people right between the eyes with something you think is really great. Because if you got them hungry and you hit them between the eyes with that, as I said just earlier, you own them. Right. And uh, looking at your... Um uh, in reading the book and, and looking at like your menu pairings, you know, I, I saw what you did. Like you had the gentleman that had uh, that went to a hotel and they gave him the the boilerplate menu, and you you went through and you said, well, you know, that's fine and all, but let's do this, you know, and and you know the suggestions and, and reading that. I mean, you know, yeah, I'm in the industry and I looked at that and I'm like, yeah, 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 and I was like, okay, and then you broke it down. I said, you know what? He's right. These are things that everybody gets it's it's gonna it's gonna taste crappy it's gonna it's gonna taste like shoe leather you know it, it, you know like I said crudités and all that here's what it is my daughter went to Cornell Hotel School and we, we chatted about this you know when you I tell these executives because here's what the average executive does they've got to do some super you know a national sales meeting or board of directors meeting and somebody gets delegated the job they go to the hotel they talk to the food and beverage director or the catering manager the catering manager holds up something and says to them, tell you what, these are our signature salads. Uh, we have nine of them, although these three are the best. These are our crudite. This is the appetizers we recommend. We have a little intermezzo course that's cleansing the palate, kind of nice. And I'm going, these, these are boilerplate menus that the, their team, their catering team, has designed to have the lowest food cost, the lowest wine cost, and the lowest labor cost so they can keep their job. That's where they're going to present you. So I always tell people, you don't want that. You don't need any salad. When's the last time, Mark, you went to some great meeting and had a dinner and you, you came home and you said to your wife, your girlfriend, hey, honey, how about that salad last night? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, Mark, you had one because for eight ninety five they sell them to you and they make them for 50 cents. Right. So they're always going to try to give you the salad. They're going to have this intermezzo palate cleansing course. I went to the University of Bordeaux, studied professional wine tasting. They never told me my palate got dirty, didn't need any cleansing. So that silly ass $7.95 cor course, you can lose that right off the bat. We don't need that. And you start talking to catering managers like that, they, they know you know the business. Right, you know, you right. The fluff in there. Let's start with lobster, okay? Let's start with butter poached lobster. <laughs> you know, and, and um, uh, I think that's something that, you know, in your book that, you know, it's, it's very important that if you're going to be doing entertaining that, you know, I think one of the things I got out of this was you're trying to wow your client. You know, yeah. if you're going to secure a business deal, then you need to give them something that not to, not that not that it's going to be the food necessarily, but the whole event, the whole experience needs to be memorable. So the food is part of it, along with the wine and just everything else that goes with it. Any any sommelier will tell you, you are not taking care of a client to slake their thirst, get them high on, on alcohol or wine, and feed them a lot, you're there to create an experience. And I'm trying to teach my, my audience, my executives, that you know, you've got to create an indelible experience for your clients. And the way you do that is to teach them something. So I, as you saw in the book, I recommend you always serve wines in pairs. Mm -hmm. You can't remember a wine from one hour to another, but so if you put two wines side by side, and you're tasting an Oregon Pinot Noir and a California Pinot Noir, and you ask your guests which one do you think is which, you know, they're probably going to say, well, I, I, I wouldn't know that. So you help them out. You say, well, look, you know, Oregon's north, colder, grapes aren't as ripe. They're leaner, lower alcohol, a little edgier, more acidic. They taste the two wines. They pick the one that's from Oregon for sure. And they go, is this the Oregon one? And you go, yeah. And they feel like they want to pat themselves on the back. It's like, wow, I just learned that from Mark Fusco. So I'm trying to tell people, serve two wines, 
and serve the ones that have a point about them that can be made that these people can take away. Because you do that to your friends, I guarantee in 60 days they're going to have somebody over and they're going to do a Peter Noir from California, Oregon tasting because they learned it from Mark Fusco. Right. So I'm just saying you need to transfer these skills to someone else so they have takeaway value from your dining events and that attracts people to Mark Fusco and, and, and company. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is the power entertaining strategies in my book are used as a business development strategy. You know, you can take somebody out for golf, that works too. I'm just saying go to a restaurant, but go to a restaurant and spin it on them like Assam thinks. I assign my book sometimes, think like Assam. And the point is, you know, treat them well. How do you do that? Go to a, go to a restaurant that has Assam, a certified, advanced, master, whatever, and bond with that guy or that gal so that they know you mean business when you come into their restaurant and you want the private dining room only. It's I'm, Don't get me started. I, I Most of these guys don't have, I mean, I'm going after, well, business schools, whatever. They don't know anything and I'm not trying to teach them to be wine experts. I'm saying leverage the use of a sommelier. Let them be your expert. Just mm -hmm. tip 5% <laughs> and you number one. Right, and, and like you said, you know, they. You know, find find that find that psalm and you know connect with them. And you, you even talked about like you know calling them up ahead of time or, or checking out their wine list online. And and if you don't like what you hear, then move on. Find one you do have yeah. chemistry. Spend a couple of times until you find the right person, and then take some of your your business dollars that you're dedicating to entertaining clients or future prospective clients, and dedicate that budget to one or two of these restaurants where you've got the psalm in your pocket. And you give them the business, they're going to return it to you, and you're going to look like a star. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's it. it, it a lot of it really is that that um, uh, relationship that you build with that song. You find somebody or a couple guys that 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 you connect with. You know, it's very important. Uh, you even talked about it. And, and the good advice, no matter what, is you know, if you're going to a wine merchant or going to a wine shop, is and you know, finding that person that's going to be able to answer your questions and then you can, they can learn your palate so they know what you like so they can steer you in the right direction with your budget and your palate and all that. Yeah, it was, I mean and I have a I think it was chapter 7 or something it's called your new best friend the psalm and the wine merchant. You need to have a couple of psalms in your pocket meaning they they know who you are and they know that you come in and tip cash and you know don't ask for the check to come to the table and you know what's doing right. And conversely, if that psalm turns you on to a wine that you like, then you need to find a wine merchant who can say, well, Mark, I understand you like the Sank Sapage, you know, from Sonoma. Uh, I just tasted the new vintage uh, at a trade tasting, and it's coming in. There's not quite as much as there was last year, but can I tuck some aside for you, put six bottles in the back room? So now you're, now you're working the Psalm, and you're working the, the, the wine merchant. You know, not a bottle shop owner, but somebody who's a dedicated, some guy who probably owned a restaurant or was a Psalm before. That way, that guy's working for you. He's, he's got your profile. He's got it in the computer at a point of sale machine. And... Um, He's calling you up, going, "Hey, the new the new vintage of the stuff you bought last year, you like, is coming in." So he's taking care of you. The Psalm's taking care of you, and you don't need to be a freaking expert on wine because these business execs I talk to, they have no inclination, and they don't have no time to go study wine. You and I, wine's a hobby, but to them, they have no time and they're fearful. So what do they do? They always order the same wine because it's safe. Right. You know, Ab Chardonnay, Merlot, whatever, Mondavi, this, whatever. They always go the same. These guys always order steak, uh, salmon chicken, lamb chops. That's all they ever do. So all I'm going to say is if you want to fly with like the eagles, you've got to go above that. Mm -hmm. So therefore think like Assam does. I can tell you that getting, personally getting into wine and all that, that's grown not just my wine palate because, you know, I would just drink wine, you know, whatever, but, you know, has, has expanded my food palate. You know, I was very much the always the same, always the same, you know, go to a restaurant. It, it, it still happens a little bit, you know, I go I order maybe the same things, but now when I go to a restaurant, if I see something interesting, I'm not afraid to try it. You yeah. know, I do have my preferences, and if, if it's something that the the ingredients don't look like it's gonna, I'm gonna like it, maybe I can alter it a bit, but basically I'm more apt to try it, you know, instead of yeah, like, you know, you're, ugh. You're open-minded, and yeah. you know, People are not, they're kind of set in their ways, and that's fine. I have all business to, designed around that. I mean, imagine you got somebody uh, coming over to your house, and uh, you serve them some shellfish, and they're wailing away on these little shellfish things, and someone says, uh, Mark, these are great. What are these things? And you say, well, those are percebes, you know, P-E-R-C-E-B-E-S. And they go, what, what's that? What's a mollusk from Portugal? And they'll say something like this, really, where'd you get it, Mark? And you'll say, uh, Portugal. <laughs> if they have to ask, FedEx. Right. And so I, I'm thrilled with, as you probably saw my foodie chapter in the yes. 
Well, you want to impress somebody, you're not going to find this stuff at Whole Foods. You're not going to find anything special at Whole Foods. It's nice stuff. Everybody's shopping there, so everybody's fishing ostensibly from the same pond. How are you going to look different? You go to the internet. You go to D'Artagnan.com. You go to LaTienda.com. You go to you know RussianDaughters.com, and you buy you know you buy you know at Thanksgiving everybody's doing turkey. But well, then why would you want to be like everybody else? Get some game birds from Scotland and still have buckshot in them from D'Artagnan, and people go, man, this is unbelievable, you know. Or get some Ventresca tuna belly, you know, from from Spain, or or get some uh, you know the jamón iberico from La Tienda, where the pigs are only fed acorns. People put that in their mouth, they go, my God, what is this? I've never had this in my life. That's right. You can't buy it at Whole Foods because it's too damn expensive. It's got to be a hand sell. It's perishable. They're not going to carry it. So getting people to realize that instead of gassing your car up and spending $5 a gallon for gas and spending an hour trying to shop through something and find anything good, people should start learning that food can be bought on the Internet, better food you can ever find. To move anywhere, gas your car, you just got to have your Visa card and the willingness to double-click something, and it's overnighted to you tomorrow. Well, I'm, I'm for sure uh, uh, not a novice when it comes to electronics and, and, and Amazon and buying online. Um, but, you know, reading the book and, and, and I guess I knew you could order food online, but I guess I didn't realize the level of food that you could buy online. Oh, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing you can get anything online now. And um, so few people understand it. I, I'm just thrilled to, to show people, hey, go here, buy this. Uh, you know, send me your tasting notes. You'll be, they'll be thanking you forever. Now, right. some of these things, like that Hamoni Berco, um, the Bellota, the acorn fed stuff, I take that everywhere because you can put it in a cryovac thing. You just put it in a little cooler and take it somewhere. You open it up, put it on a plate. You don't even need bread. People put it in their mouth and they go nuts. <laughs> I, I, I've had that like once or twice, and I uh -huh. can tell you it's, it is amazing stuff. Um, you know, and I read, I read of, I, it, it made me crave it. I was like, oh, I need to have some of this again, you know. It's, it's addictive, you know, and, uh, and that's the idea is that, you know, maybe it's, it is very expensive. It's 75 to to $100 a pound. But, you know, for $8 a person, you can put something in front of people, and as long as you're hidden between that first 15-minute window when they come into your house or in a restaurant and you know they're starving and they haven't eaten dips and chips and rolls and fish at the bar, um, if they're hungry and you put that in their mouth, they're going to love you, Mark. It's all about <laughs> It's all about being cool. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that's what, you know, wine makes people cool, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. well, well, people don't know much, so if you can share something for them that they can use on their friends, not just that you're trying to impress them because look what I got, look what I spent. No, you show them something that they can transfer to their friends, and that way they will always come to an event that your company might throw or that you might have a party. They're going to, if they have a choice for where to go, they're going to Fusco's because he does chicken right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I look at it this way, um, uh, you know, with wine, you know, like, like you said, you know, these execs and just your, 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 your friends, you know, they don't know a whole lot about wine. You don't have to, you don't necessarily have to, to break out every piece of knowledge on it, but they want to learn something. You know, if you can give them something, you know, during your event or even just friends are over and you've got this wine and say, hey, let me tell you about this wine. It doesn't have to be a hundred dollar bottle of wine. It could be, you know, it could be maybe 30 or 40. And and something there they might go hey you know I I can I'll spend that much money for something better than my ten dollar bottle of wine you know you know as you saw in uh, my chapter six where I talked about the wine pairings I said here's twenty four pairs of wines I always serve wines in pairs so they have something intellectual and I'm going if you don't know much about wine or what to learn go to your psalm and say hey Eddie says I don't know the difference between left bank and right bank Bordeaux I don't know the difference between Cote de Bone and Cote de Nuit these are pairs. Those you take to them, you show them that Cote de Bone and Cote de Nuit are sort of masculine and feminine, etc. Left back, right back are different grapes from Merlot to Cabernet. And once they know that and they share that with their friends, you know, their friends are walking away going, you know, they can use the word left bank. And that's all you, yeah, that's all they want to do. Yeah, we, we're a big left bank drinker, you know. That, it's just fun stuff. And I just love sharing these kind of tips. I mean, this weekend I got a great event. I'm, I'm a pilot, so I'm flying my Cessna to uh, Reno, and I'm going to talk to 200 of the top women gamblers in the United States at the Atlantis Casino, and I'm doing a crazy dinner where I come in as a, an imposter speaking French. I'm going to, I make them have fun, and I make them walk away with information, and they pay me a lot of money for that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good job. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so, how did you get really from, so, you know, I read the book, so you finished, I love the story about, about the, the, the drive to the airport and the the radiator and the wine. Well, I hated it, but I loved it. Like you said, it was kind of you know both ways. But so you got back to the United States. Um, I mean, it wasn't like an overnight thing. But how did you transition to something 
from from that into what you're doing now? I mean, well, you know, I was I was living in Honolulu and because uh, <clears throat> that's where I originated from, and uh, you know, I, I was a you know I was big guy, a wine guy in Honolulu, and uh, this friend of mine calls me up from New York City, who I met in Bordeaux, and he said, Eddie. <clears throat> What the heck is America's at the time only master sommelier doing living in Honolulu? He goes, don't tell me. You're a big freaking dealer. You're on Hawaii Magazine or something like that. He goes, if I were you, I'd see if how good you really are. I'd move yourself to New York City, and try that out. And he said, just try it out for five years. So I thought about it. I thought, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Okay. So I moved to New York City, and for a year and a half, it was tough because I was nobody. People didn't even know what a master sommelier was. Believe it or not, 1970, they didn't even know. Very few. I was the only one. Um, but after a while, I got to know the people there, the, you know, the Joshua Wessons, the Kevin Israelis, the Rory Callahans, all the really cool folks there. And, um, you know, I got in with the in people, and then I started meeting everybody in the world. And so I started, you know, and then I, then I moved, well, then I joined the International Wine Center back when it was in the initial stages when Rory Callahan founded it with Mary Mulligan. And... Um, what a fabulous, you know, I was director of trade education. I wrote a book back then called Wine and the Bottom Line. It was written for the National Restaurant Association. There I was training staffs in restaurants. So I did a lot of staff training and restaurant trainings, and I had a wine school that had 5,000 students go through it. But then I realized the guy and the gals that really need me are the business people because they don't get that kind of training in college. And so after that, I just moved into that arena for the past 20 years, but very heavily in the last 15 and that's all I do are, you know, Young Presidents Organization events, Entrepreneurs Organization events, Vistas International, 245 presentations in the last seven years. I mean, I, I booked my card on, on that, and I'm very, very focused on a very tiny little niche, but I've been working it for 15 years, so they know me. Right, right. So, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I got to uh, meet Kevin Zraeli uh, in person uh, a couple months ago. I had him on the show. Uh, we did a believe the, the, yeah, I had the Brunello tasting down in Houston, um, so it was awesome to do that. Um, See, so yeah, I mean, it was something that you 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 transitioned and you saw you saw a, a need for something that nobody was fulfilling, basically. A niche. Yeah. You know, I mean, Kevin and I go back. I met Kevin Israeli. I was a salesman at a at, at a, a Bordeaux wine shop called La Vinothèque, and Kevin Israeli came in with Hugh Johnson's book, and he he says something like uh, "Je vous dirai acheter." Um, Chateau Aubryon, and they all kind of looked at me and said, here's one of your American buddies. But I mean, I met him when he was just starting, and right. I was just starting. So we go way back, and we're good friends. And we both know you got to start somewhere, and, uh, you know, we, we both remember each other fighting our way through trying to figure out, you know, how to pronounce this or that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, I, I, I butcher a few pronunciations <laughs> here and there still, um, I, you know. I, my daughter is taking his wine course now in New York. Just I only had one course first week, so... Yeah, it's amazing to also have a daughter, and now she's taking Kevin's course. And I remember when he was saying, "I got to go back and do a course or whatever." <laughs> Funny nice. stuff. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, with with uh, meeting Kevin and in the course, that was awesome. Um, and of course, you know, seeing in the book how what you know what you're doing with that, um, you know, it's just there was there was a, things in here like one of the things I really liked, especially because you know you you are kind of giving people an idea of what's happening is uh, the chapter where you kind of basically go through the major, uh, the, yeah, the so, so Many Wines chapter. You know, I loved reading this whole thing and, um, you know, you, you, you really explain these things really great in, in the sense that the average person could get something out of it. It, 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 it wasn't, you know, it was geared towards that level, you know, and, and yeah, it's it's a lower level. I, I you don't see me speaking at the the high end wine events around the country. That's not my market. Right. I love I love attending them, but that's not. I'm not talking to the one percent of people who are wine collectors and have big sellers. That's not my market. I want the little guy who wants to look a little more powerful because he or she hasn't had any education. So in that you know too many you know so many wines to discuss. I'm going. I tell the executive here. You buy yourself an under the counter wine refrigerator. You can get them at Costco for two hundred bucks. They hold 40 bottles of wine. I tell you in the chapter, put these 40 bottles in there. You know, you got to have a Chianti Classico. You know, you got to have this. You got to have this from, you know, New Zealand. You got to have this from South Africa. And then you create a little Excel spreadsheet. And when someone comes to your house, here's the cool move. You hand them this list and you go, here, here's uh, my wine list in my cellar. Pick something. And they're kind of saying, wow, 
you have the generosity to say, take anything out of your cellar I want. And of course, you want to cherry pick it out of the more expensive ones so you have just what you right. want. But you're telling them, I don't know what you like, but try something different because there's 40 different wines from places all over the planet. You know, don't just drink ABC, you know, anything but Chardonnay, anything but Cabernet. Right. So instead of saying, because too often people come out and say, well, Mark, tonight uh, my wife and I are prepared this dish. We're going to have a fish course and a meat course. And with the fish, we're going to have this Poulini Monarche. And with the meat course, we're having this Cabernet Sauvignon from Hell Mountain. And it's going like, you're having this because we like it. I'd rather people say, tell you what, go over to the counter. Uh, we've opened uh, four bottles of wine. We've got kind of a dry white from Germany. We've got a, a, a little fruitier white, uh, a little more full body. Then we've got a light red from Italy. And uh, we've got a Spanish monster. You know, go try the four wines. And... Uh, when we have dinner, why don't you come back with whatever you seem to like? And the people will come back and everybody's got something different. Mm -hmm. So and tell them what you're going to have. It's like I don't like when a winemaker at a dinner gets up and says, pick up your asparagus and taste my Sauvignon Blanc and nod and agree with me. They go together. I don't want somebody telling me how they taste because when I was in Bordeaux, one of the interesting things they did was they measured our sensitivity to the four elementary flavors of sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Right. They call it thresholds of perception. So basically, they were taking an imprint of our taste profile, and we found that everybody in the room, some people were sensitive to bitterness, some people were not, some to sweetness. And why they did that was every time they put a team of tasters together, they wanted to have a team of tasters who were homogeneous in their taste profile. So if you were all sensitive to acidity, you all would taste things pretty similarly. You come over to this country, and I get thrown into some wine judging. And, um, you know, I got a guy from this part of the country and this part of the country, and we're arguing about these wines because these people are never going to like a wine maybe that's too acidic because their taste profiles don't like that. They don't get it. So you've got to homogenize the, the teams. And in France, they really took it to the, to the nth degree. So I tell, try to tell people, your fingerprints are as different as anybody else's, right? Why would you think that your tongue can figure with all these taste buds is any different than your fingerprints? It's not. So you've got to learn to go with your gut. And if you happen to like $5 rosés, bingo. That's what you like. Right. You know? Exactly. So, um, <coughs> they, uh, um, uh, so yeah, we're, we're, so in France, I mean, they, they've got this down pretty much, well, not to a, probably to a science, you know, they, they, do you think, do you think we're getting to the point in the United States where we're, we're understanding this, this taste, or is it really more of your wine, the, the really wine connoisseurs are the ones no. that are kind of getting it? No, they're, they're, it's, they're moving along at a, at a real clip. But, I mean, France has been doing it for, you know, hundreds of years, you know. And uh, so they, they know what they're doing. And their wine is, you know, it, I, I hate to use a colloquial phrase, uh, like wine, they're food wines. But, I mean, you know, I can understand when someone sits in an Italian bar and wears a glass of Chianti and tastes it because they're an Italian wine restaurant and they don't like it because it's got so much tannin and so much acidity, where it's a Barbera or whatever. Those wines are screaming, hey, look, I got all this acid and I'm going to throw it at some fat and food and grilled meat. Mm -hmm. And so those wines are designed to go with food, where a lot of American wines are designed to be delicious by themselves. You know how many fruit for Pinot Noirs are just lovely by themselves. You don't even need food with them. So, you know, I, it's very interesting to see, as I say, the French have always been thinking about wine and food together. I mean, here's one of the things I love to share with people. And it's when I, I, I do dinners. That's, I, I'm a during dinner entertainer. I speak during dinners. And I put, you know, pairs of wines for people in front of each other. But then I give them this business uh, formula called one plus one equals three, which I call synergy, where you can take the components of two separate things, put them together, and they equal more than the separates do. And I go, well, that's, that's a postulate in, in business. But in order for you to see what a wine can do for a food, you shouldn't treat it like a beverage. And how do you do that? I go, you eat your food if it's rich with a lot of sauce on it. And instead of swallowing it and then having your glass of wine to chase it and kind of wash it down, you eat your food and then introduce a little bit of wine in your mouth with the food in your mouth at the same time. And people look back at me like, are you kidding? And I go, you got to try this. Because the wine maybe by itself is like a knife blade, a little, a little sharp. Mm -hmm. You put the food in your mouth, the food comes over the top of the blade, dulls the blade, so the wine doesn't taste so sharp. And when people start to see by combining food in their wine in the, in the mouth at the same time, wow, the wine makes the food taste better. The food makes the wine taste better, and my, my axiom I say is each wine and food, each should amplify each other's assets, meaning wine is really a condiment, like salt and pepper is to a steak, or ketchup is to french fries, you know, or lemon juice is on fish. And once people recognize that wine is really a spice or a condiment, and not a beverage to wash your food down with, they think of it a whole lot differently, and they start, 
they start moving into the, the arena of buying more wine. I mean, here's an interesting fact. Um, I read this a couple of years ago that the average American spends between seven ninety five and fourteen ninety five on a bottle of wine. That's why all the bottles of wine in the supermarket are floor I at eye level are floor stacked at that price range and everybody's fighting for a little market share there. Right. I say it this way, and this, this doesn't give me any points because people don't always believe me, but I'm going, you want to wow somebody and you want to throw a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet at them, it's not going to happen from $7.95 to $14. You know that. You're looking more like $30 to $35. And if you think of it this way, if the average person, I understand their budgets, and I understand, you know, you know, most people would never spend that kind of money, but I'm talking power entertaining. I'm not talking about entertaining your friends or your neighbors. I'm talking about securing a client. You want heads to turn. You want people to like you. Sometimes it's time to ante up some money, pony it up, spend the $35 a bottle, and have them kind of light bulb go on like, whoa, what is this? Because if the average person doesn't spend more than $14.95 on a bottle of wine, that's why they don't collect it. That's why they don't talk about it, because they never had a super good wine. So it's up to you, you know, my power entertaining readers, to serve these people some of this stuff I'm telling you about and watch them light up. And by lighting up, they like you and they'll always come to your events, and that grows their business. Nice, yeah. I mean, <coughs> you know, like I said, I mean, if if they're if everyone's buying, you know, that that range of wine, and and you've got these wines that are going to be more expensive, they're not they're not going to get that that range. It's just going to be kind of the same, you know. There's going to be a sameness, you know. I mean, and and it's not to, it's not to say there aren't any good values in in, in wine that are fifteen bucks and under. Plenty like you good said, wine fifteen dollars. They just ain't good cabernets and pinot noirs. Don't, they don't exist. Yeah, but. What you're trying to what you're trying to say is, it, this, if you're if you're out there trying to get a client, if you're trying to do, to really make a great impression on somebody, then you're, you're gonna have to spend a little more money. You know, this isn't this isn't your buddies coming over and we're gonna drink some wine or beer or whatever it is. And if you're gonna spend a little more money, front load the budget. In other words, do it in the first 15 minutes because they'll like anything. I don't care if you burn shrimp; they'll like them in the first 15 minutes because they're starving. <laughs> they're gobbling them down. You know, so while they're in that gobbling mode, make sure you're putting something in their mouth that they like, a wine and food combination that you think, you know, you really want to show off to them. And every time it works. Right. People, people build their menus and they have, you know, as I said earlier, they have the shrimp and their dips and chips and then the salad and intermezzo. By the time they get to the rack of lamb an hour later, their, their appetite is a two out of ten and they'll eat the food, but they're not patting you on the back going, hey, Mark, that's one hell, heck of a rack of lamb you got there, buddy. So, you know. <laughs> The, the, the good stuff out of a buffet is at the end of the line. I go, go deep, go around, go end around. <laughs> the good stuff is at the start of the end of the line. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, and one of the things you talk about in, in here also is is um, beer. Not doing the run-of-the-mill beer, you know, going out and getting something that's different, you know, getting those getting craft beer. I just finished, uh, you know, talking to people about Super Bowl stuff, and I said, hey, look, you know, I don't bring wine to Super Bowl. People expect beer. They're eating nachos and stuff, salt and fat and all that. So beer is indicated. So what are you going to do? You're going to go and bring some kind of you know Heineken or Coors or something, you know Corona? No, man. You go to the best brew pub in your town, and you get a to-go growler or whatever, however vehicle they're giving away beer there, and you taste a couple of them. You bring several kinds, so it's not just one. You bring that to the party. I guarantee that's the first beer to go down, and everybody's going to think you're the the life of the party because you went out of your way to go to a brew pub to bring the freshest stuff that was made yesterday. Nothing tastes better than that. Right, that's what you got to do with beer. <laughs> and I think I think that's one of the things. Like just as, as a psalm, people need to remember it's not just the wine. There, there's other things that that psalms do have to know about, and they need to they need to be able to uh, uh, handle. Which you know, beer is one of them. I mean, it's not this. It's not, not necessarily the number one thing, but you know, beer and talking about spirits and service and and I mean, I know cigars aren't as big as they used to be, but. You know that that whole that whole gamut of of knowledge. Yeah, it's fun to try all these things. I mean, look at look at sake for example. And most people experience of sake as something hot, right? You know, and, and you know when when you start studying sake, you realize that the reason why they serve that stuff hot is because it it it, it uh, you don't get the impurities, but it's pretty rat gut stuff, you know. But all sake should be served slightly chilled, and um, you know it gets expensive, but it's. Uh, some of them are quite an experience. They're expensive, but they're they're a different different animal. And you know you don't eat so you don't drink sake by itself. It has to be with food. Uh huh. No one's just going to a bar and drinking sake by itself. No one does that. Except for the, you know, the college students doing sake bombs. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one time, you know. <coughs> You know? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that's probably the most I've ever done with sake. Is I've had not not a lot, but I've had a couple of those. Um, you know that that is definitely a, a, a something I'd need to 
really get into a little bit more is sake because it's 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 fascinating. Just you know, email me, call me, or or talk to any good psalm, and they'll tell you about some daijingo, you know, some really good stuff. Junmai daijingo, where where you know you're going to spend some money, but you're going to say this is sake. I didn't, I had no idea, <laughs> and that's a, that's the thrill is to have someone to go, geez, I never thought sake would taste this good. Right. Go, it does. It does. Because like I said, most of us, you know, the experience is, you know, hot. It's, you know, even up until I really started getting into all this, I really thought that that's how you serve sake was hot. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I, I started reading a little bit about sake. I'm like, really? You, you don't serve it hot? Okay. Well, why? Oh, I see why. Okay. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, just like, you know, serving wine at a proper temperature. Oh, um, let's just, let's, let's t- talk about that. I mean, everybody's talked about that before, but, you know, a wine, a red wine, for example, has three components basically going on. You got sweetness, you got sourness, and you got bitterness. Bitterness from tannins, barrels, sourness from six different organic acids, and sweetness from two components, sugar and alcohol. Well, alcohol does not taste sweet at room temperature. It burns, it's got a caustic bite. So you need to drop the wine's temperature down 10 degrees under room temperature so the alcohol becomes sweet. If you, if you take anything sweet and chill it, it becomes sweeter. Chocolate milk tastes better cold and warm. Yeah, why? Because it's sweeter. Mm-hmm. So I said to people pretty simply is that if you, once you've learned that red wine must be served at 65 degrees or 62 degrees, whatever, whatever you like, um, and you realize that if you taste it warm versus cool, you like the one better, then I put the, then I put the statement this way. Once you've learned that, it's an insult to serve anyone a fine wine, red wine, at room temperature. It's an insult. It's like bringing lobster bisque and saying, well, when the chef made it, it was hot, but I'm sorry, it's a little lukewarm right now. It's just as bad as that. I, I made this point once. I was at a place called the Classic Cup in Kansas City. It was, a, it was a single malt scotch bar. And I told the people about the temperatures of wine, and red wine got to chill it a bit. So then they called me up upstairs. There, and I'm sitting upstairs, and these guys are drinking 25, 28-year-old McAllen's and, you know, really expensive si- single malts. And they had a they had an ice bucket there. They had a bottle of water in there that was chilling down. And I, I, this guy poured me this glass. I mean, it was like fifty bucks a shot. And I said, I, I tried something. I took the glass and I just dipped it in the ice bucket of ice and water for about two minutes. I chilled the scotch down. I then poured him a, a glass of that compared to the one he was drinking that was room temperature. And the light bulb went on. He said, My God, the scotch is sweeter and it doesn't burn. So I said, yeah, you ought to keep your single malt scotch, the expensive stuff you have in a refrigerator so that you don't need to compromise the integrity of the drink with an ice cube because that's melting, that's water. You're right. putting something that expensive, you don't have to. You chill the scotch. Well, you know, I said that, the word went around the bar, and finally the owner came to me and he said, I want you to stop this nonsense you're telling everybody right now because if I have to start chilling my scotch, I'm going to have to get all kinds of refrigeration. He goes, if you continue this, this uh, he called it something else. If you continue <laughs> this content, I'm going to kick your ass out of the restaurant. <laughs> nice. Temperature's fun. It's fun to show people that, you know, alcohol is great, but if it's served at the wrong temperature, it burns you. And, um, you know, that's why people keep vodka or tequila in their freezer because it, it's smoother. Mm-hmm. Well, wine's got alcohol in it too, not as much, but the alcohol bites. And you don't want what we call the proverbial hot finish. The aftertaste kind of grabs you and you go, eh. I don't like right. that. No, exactly, exactly. So um, uh, with the book, um, what, what is the biggest, what is, what, I guess what is the most important thing to really get out of if somebody who's going to read this book um, that they really need to uh, uh, get out of that? Well, I'm just trying to say to people, look, you're, you are trying to create an indelible experience. If you're trying to entertain a client and woo them in, you've got to give them some takeaway knowledge. So you want to have some fun, you tell them some fun stories, but you just want to give them a little kernel, a little piece of information that they can take on and take them outside their comfort zone. You know, um, I signed a book, Be Outrageous. This is the only place where it's not crowded. You know, it's not, not there. <laughs> it's not original. You know, another phrase I use is, uh, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta, you gotta be outrageous because you know most people are just playing, you know, with blinders the same way, and it works and it's safe. But you gotta beat, you know, if you're you're if you're a graduate MBA student out of out of Cornell or something like that, and you're going down to Manhattan to work to the, the audience, and your your boss is gonna send you out prospecting for clients. You gotta take them out to restaurants. What do you know about taking someone out to a restaurant? You better learn, or or you're or you're you know you're you're pawn for it, and you're not looking sharp. 
So it's another whole it's another whole level of experience. So I encourage anyone to take any wine course they can, because it's going to give them a leg up. Yeah, I mean that totally. I mean that's going to give you that edge because, you know, you're you're going to go take out the client. You're going to look like you know what you're doing because you you've studied a little bit. They're going to be impressed. You're going to get the contract where your buddy over here in the next cubicle, you know, he, yeah. he's he's not going to get that sale. No, he's not. He's not going to close a deal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is all about food, wine, golf. You know, there used to be cigars in there, too. But, I mean, it's it's that kind of chemistry that, 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 that really, you know, you can grab onto people because everybody likes to eat, of course. Right. And so you just, you just got to capture them when they're hungry and hit them between the eyes with something great every time on a consistent basis so you're flying with the eagles at a higher altitude and um, you know people start really noticing that you know you don't want to miss a Fusco event because you can't figure the guy out that's who I am. I mean, don't even try to figure me out I mean I'm, I'm gonna tell you one thing and do something else because I can I like, <laughs> I like screw with people's minds you know yeah, I, I went to your website and uh, um, it was a great website and um, I saw one of the videos of, of, of your you know presentation and, and how you you come out, and and even I was kind of like this dude's from New Jersey. He, how, why does he have a French accent? <laughs> That's just a fun thing I do. I've been doing it for many years. Uh, one day I just I just was in a goofy mood and I I thought I'd come out and pretend to be some you know some to be the antithesis of what people look at when they want a sommelier. The, the guy that is looking down his nose. You know his name is Gaston. You know, so I. I came out and said, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Edmund Osler, I'm a master sommelier, this evening I'm going to teach you about the food and what. And people in the audience are kind of going, oh, we got to sit through this clown? You know? So I take him out a little further and I go, is, uh, is everyone ready? <laughs> well, they're sitting there all dressed up, they're hungry for dinner, so they go, yeah. I go, well, yeah. I go, for that? Huh? I don't think so. <laughs> and we kick it off. So I love that. I just run a rug pull. I love head fakes, rug pull. You told me this. No, we're doing that. It's fun, and that's what psalms do, you know. So um, I think more people should think like a psalm. Yeah. Well, and, and I can tell you, you know, um, in, in the psalms that I have met over the past few years that I've gone into this, you know, I don't know. If, I have not met any psalm that I would consider stuffy. Um, you know, I think, I think that's, you know, the, the psalms are finally or hopefully getting that, that reputation, you know, getting that, you know, beaten yeah. down because... You know, um, you know, meeting you via Skype, meeting uh, uh, meeting all the guys that when I go to Texom, um, you know, J meeting James, um, uh, meeting Drew uh, from Houston, you know, and then uh, there's there's a couple masters up there in Austin, uh, Craig and um, uh, Devin, you know, and so meet, meeting the masters first of all, but just not just not just the masters, everyone else that's involved with with food and wine and and Mark, you know, there's twenty thousand sommeliers. Yeah. In States, can you believe that? You know, and, and and just just you know, meeting all these people, whether they're masters or their first levels, or they haven't even taken their first test yet. You know, they're they're just the wine guy at their restaurant. You know, or the wine guy in their group of. The wine guy in the restaurant is you know he's a, he's a kingpin or she's a kingpin there, and if they're good at what they do, they're they're moving through life. They don't need credentials really. I mean, right. you know, some people need them, but you don't need them. I mean, if you're if you're if that's your passion, it shows. You know, so I, you know, I just, I just say to people who don't know Psalms, get, get friendly with a couple of them, you know, get, you know, find a way to bond with some Psalms because yeah. they're going to make your life better. Yeah, we're, we're some cool guys and after work we'd like to have a beer or two, you know? <laughs> exactly. We like it. We're normal people and, uh, you know, and we like to talk story afterwards and see, see what, see what's happening. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty set in my ways too. I spent so much time in, in France and Italy that, uh, you know. If given a choice, I'm I'm drinking Bordeaux and Burgundy just because mm -hmm. I'm used to it. Exactly. But, you know. Well, Eddie, I I uh, I absolutely really appreciate uh, you you uh, being on the show. Um, it was awesome. This book is awesome. First of all, I'll have all your contact information below. But if you go to Eddie's website, uh, you can get the book. I uh, can also contact you about booking you for an event and all the advice you know about about the event. Um, you know, it was. Uh, this f personally for me, uh, and I told you before we before we started. You know, I thought the book was great, um, well, thank and, you. and and I did read it cover to cover, um, and uh, I spent most of the day yesterday reading it, everybody, and I spent I finished the you know this morning I finished it up, um, you know, and even even for somebody like me and, and what I do, I mean, there's there's things that you can get out of this. So, 
Um, if you're in the restaurant, if you're if you're in the restaurant industry, if you're in the retail industry, if you're in the wine side of things, the professional side, you can you can get stuff off of this. And I think it's really good because you can think about if someone's coming to you, um, and and they're used to just the boilerplate type menu that. You know, maybe you you do think outside of the box. Maybe you didn't think you could do some of these things, and and there's resources in here that you can uh, you can go to online for food, beverage, and all that. So I think it, it's even for people like me, this is a, this is a good book uh, because it gives you ideas of what you can and you know what you can do. There's no can't. It's just what you can do. You know, and it's available just, again. The the deal is leverage the experts. You know, buy the food on the internet for these people who can ship you stuff that's cool. You know, and do the same with wines, bond with the sound, bond with the, the retailer or the wine, you know, merchant. And, uh, you know, it's, again, it's all about making you look special. Yeah. So, so you, attract, you attract people into your life. It's all about connectivity. Exactly. That's what that's about is how to connect with people through food and wine. Exactly. Well, um, again, uh, stop, by, stop by the website. I'll have the links below uh, under the video. Uh, get the book. Uh, it's a great book. You know, check out the website. Lots of resources on there. Um, uh, videos of, of Eddie if you want to kind of get an idea what what his presentations are like um, I thought that was awesome um, but yeah you know definitely stop by uh, and check it out uh, Eddie you got any final thoughts you want to go out with you know not, not really I'm just I'm just saying you know stretch your stretch yourself you know find people to take you outside your box <clears throat> because um, life's you know life's too boring to, to, to have you know normal everyday wine you want to try something different and you know, some people don't know how to do that, so the, the sommelier in your town is going to take you to the next level and keep taking you there, and you probably start spending more money, and you'll be mad at me for saying that, but you've got to have some <coughs> and, and who knows, maybe you find a new passion, you join us, you know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, folks, uh, that we're going to wrap it up here. Um, as always, thanks for stopping by. Click the links above to friend me up. Uh, I'll have links to Eddie's stuff below. Leave comments below. Um, and as always, thank you for stopping by. We're going to see everyone again next time.